a human being, you have that drive to be actualized. So you quickly go on and start writing because you want it to be great. You get the musicians, you record it, you put it out there, you want to sell it, blah, 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 blah. But once people connect with it and own it, once the audience owns it, you can start looking at it and think, whoa, okay, so this is beyond me now. You can you will realize I was just a vessel for this, you know. Even though this is what I do for a living, this is my job. Yes, sir. I'm just a vessel for this. And so as long as you are honest with yourself, with your purpose, as long as your purpose is honest. And for most of us in Africa, I think I share young people, it's important to understand that little term, honesty of purpose. If your purpose is honest and you're pursuing a path that is, your, that is true to you, you have a gift. Are we in music because everybody's doing it and they're trying to make money from it? Are we in music because of the fame? But if you're in music because you have a gift, if you're in music because you have a gift, <laughs> you have talent. If you have a true gift, trust me, the true gift will not let you be. It will tell you, you must use me for the betterment of your society. You must use me for the enrichment of your people. You must use me for the development of your society. And if your purpose is pure like that, eh, all the fame and the riches that you want will come eventually. And then that, people will say, oh, you know, I had that music. It sounds like Beautiful Nubia, even if it's not him, because this is the sound of Beautiful Nubia. Even though that sound is not as if I sat down and wrote on paper that this is the sound. It has evolved out of that honesty of purpose. And I think that is the most important thing for artists. You must have honesty of purpose. You must connect with the innermost core of you. And of course, it is possible that you didn't grow up with a grandmother. You didn't grow up in an environment where you've got all these uh, things that I said influenced me. But just yes. as, any, as any human being who has been born can have a rebirth, we can immerse ourselves in the things that we make us better artists. So we, we need to go towards the things, the, the, you know, there's a lot of materials out there, a lot of materials out there that we can learn from. And you know, for the new generation who have uh, the internet with all, the, all that is out there, there's so much that we can listen to, that we can read. And if we can actually learn to go listen to elders, people who, are, who have been around longer than we, we have, and we can pick up pieces of wisdom here and there. And those things, are what will go inside us, get churned together, and then you will create your own thing. So, but to start looking for a formula yes. and say, I want my formula, it's not like something you do in the chemistry lab. No, <laughs> no, no, it doesn't work that way. You have to be a student to then become a, 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 a teacher. First, you have to learn. It doesn't stop you from producing yourself what you have right now. You can keep writing and evolving and releasing things but you have to keep learning. And it is from all this that you learn. At some point, all the ingredients will end up inside you and then they will start moving together. And that's the only way I can explain it. And then you create something. And even you will be in awe of what you have created. Because eh? when I, the, you mentioned an album now, that's Iwa album. It's like a concept album. And there's a woman who's a PhD, an American, uh, well, She's Puerto Rican, but she lives in America, in, in the US now. And she wrote a review of it, of how this album encapsulates the whole concept of uh, Omoluabi, the, the, that concept of a good character that was so essential. Because if you think about the Yoruba people of today, and I'm sorry yeah, to but, about, but I understand Yoruba culture a bit more than other cultures. If you think about the Yoruba of this of now, they're a very, very poor imitation of the Yoruba of, of old. Because in old Yoruba land, you were respected and valued based on how good your character was, not on how much money you had. Material wealth was not something that was used to, to, to rank people. It was more about your character. And so that Iwa album basically Almost all the, all the 11 songs that are in Yoruba there talk about good character. And when I listen to that album myself now, 
even though I was the one who wrote all the songs and arranged it. I look at it, I, I think, wow, how did, yes. do how did we do this? It's beyond <laughs> me now. Uh, but, but all that, don't forget, I didn't do like a formula. Mm -hmm. It's based on everything I have read. It's been everything I have heard, all the things I have learned from past masters, and all the things that have gone inside me over all these years since I was a child. And then you chant, it's there unconsciously going while you are busy hustling and doing other things. It's there. And then one day it will just come like that. And people might say, oh, it's your sound. Or they might say, you know, but what you have basically done, done is allowed yourself to become a vessel for the art, for the art form to thrive. I am not you. So I hope I answered that question because sometimes I go. You, you like, <laughs> you did. You answered the question, and I, I remember, you know, when you were answering, I, I, I listened to one of your interviews on Enyo Banke and Enyo Banke, Enyo Banke, sorry. Very good. Enyo Banke, and you, you said that until we go back to understanding who we are and take the best aspect of our traditional culture, the best of our traditional wisdom, and merge that with the best of the modern language that we, knowledge, sorry, modern knowledge that we have received, then we can create a powerful force that the world would find anew. So I, I think that was like everything that I grabbed. And I felt like you kept on you know, saying that all of that again. And I'm, I'm really grateful for that quote because it has always stayed with me that we can take what we have learned from the past or what our, our forefathers, people that have lived before us have given us and then mix it with something new, try to create works that are now much stronger, much um, civilized and strengthened to stay and live on after us. And that is in every sense, trying to tell, tell stories in music, trying to give a perspective in music because for every life situation, there is, at least from your music, I've seen that there's every song that would address that. You know, there's always, if you're feeling down, there's always a song that is always going to give you your, your um, energy. If you're feeling very good, there's always a giddy song, something that makes you feel elated and all. So ca can you talk about in a bit, you know, storytelling in music, how one can effectively give stories in music and how you that like, give stories in your music i don't know if there's a progression but is, it, is there a way you select them or you select the stories to tell or it's just like anytime it comes or there's this energy that comes forth because most people um you know there's so much we can tell about ourselves there's so much we can tell about our culture there's so much in every tribe every ethnicity there's so much to tell about our social political um, happenings in the country so much to tell you know so how do you choose the stories to tell? I remember that earlier when you said that most of your songs now, they take this depth, like something that an old man would say, but I would, I'd like to say that even in the past and in the present, how did you considerably, how did you take what, choose what to tell and choose what not to tell? Mm, well, I, th I think that process is, um, it's something that, I guess I've been doing for such a long time now, it's become like second nature. I don't really Can you think hear me? about it. I, I'm, yeah, I'm answering your question now. Okay. So I, I, I mean, that process is something that I've um, been, I've been doing it for such a long time that I don't really, now you're asking about it, I have to think about it because uh, I, um, <laughs> I mean, I don't really say this album will be a concept album or that this song as to address this issue. I just let the, you know, this subconscious mind guide me. Uh, uh, and when I'm, uh, the idea of storytelling in music, you know, we, we mustn't get carried away with the idea, with the idea that music has to always uh, maybe preach at people because there's a place for every kind of music. The pop music that causes you to go dance, uh, there's a place for that too, uh, but, the problem is when you, if you live in a corrupt society, uh, those who want to keep that society down, those who want to keep the society from reforming, 
will keep pushing dance music in your faces so that you will not have time to reflect on the things that are important, more important than just dancing, right? So, and in a society like Nigeria or many other African countries, what you find is those who have political power, who want to keep, uh, who want to keep the people dumbed down, you know, who want to keep the people uh, 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 occupied with um, uh, uh, this uh, things, that, yes. uh -huh, things mm -hmm. that will distract them. I, I call all a lot of this music tools of mass distraction. And that's what they use them for, and they support those kind of artists and they own radio stations that played all this kind of music. So on a, on the yeah, on a Monday so morning when so it's like yeah, yeah the week is starting, let's get let's get things going. The you know the radio stations in Lagos, for example, will start playing you dance music, you know, and you'll be like, what kind of society is this one? And that's not the way. So, but that is on one side, you know, it's a, uh, it's a, uh, so, but that dance music has its own role in society. It's an, an important role to play. So we mustn't get uh, into this kind of cul-de-sac where we're thinking, oh, you know, oh, the only great music is music that has uh, like positive message. No, we need, you know, all this kind of, any kind of, all, all sorts of music. But as an artist, I think one has to define what wants to say in his music. And it goes back to what I said already, you have to be true to yourself. So if you're not a flaky dance all kind of person, if you try to do dance, you people will not connect with it <laughs> because they will know this man, he, uh, he is not, this is not- It's not you your are. style. Mm -hmm. It's not your style. Uh -huh. <laughs> so I think if you are true to yourself, you know that, okay, this is what I do. It's probably a bit boring, but at least I'll get a few thousands who would like it. Uh, but those those few thousands, they will give you more joy than you trying to reach the millions, uh, who will come and dance to your dance thing that is not really working. So I think it's important again to re to re to repeat it that if we really want lasting success, we need to be true to ourselves, and our purpose has to be honest. But in choosing yes. what one says, the theme of one's music, uh, that goes to it goes to how what inspires the music I, 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 I write. I, I think that's the only way I can explain it. And the way songs come to me, uh, uh, there are several ways. The most, um, the strongest one is that organic impulse, impulse. The, the one I don't know about is the gift, where I just sit down there, I'm talking to you, and the, the tune just comes into my head. And sometimes it comes with all the words. So it's, it's songs like Seven Lives, for example, which is one of our most popular songs. You know, it's poetic, right? It's got all these mm, lines. The gifts. Uh, and it's kind of mystical. And, you know, but it came to me one evening and it just came like that about uh, to almost be 30 years ago now. Wow. More than 30 years ago, actually. Yeah, it just came into my head and I wrote and I started writing and I went to my room and I wrote the words and I wrote the melody as well because the melody came Seven with lives, it. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, when you hear it, you're thinking it's a story. Yeah, but. How did I write it? You are writing from what you have yes. read. You cannot write from yes, void. yes. Uh huh. You are writing from what you have internalized. Very metaphorical. I feel like there's something metaphorical about the seven. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, but yes. do, do you just yes. sit down and start writing that because you want to write? No. You write based on you when you get to a point, and I'm sure people who are here like DK, who is a writer, and I can see Ayo is here. Ayo Yoku is a writer too. Uh, I know the two of them. Are writers. People who are writers will tell you the same thing. You can sit down and take a pen and start writing, right? You can write if you want. And it might not go anywhere. You might get halfway and just say like, this is going nowhere. But if that impulse comes, that organic impulse comes, yeah? when that pulse, when, um, impulse, when it comes upon you, you, it will be like magic. You just do it. And something will just take off hold of your hand and that pen and you'll just be flying and the words will just fly. And it's the same thing with songwriting. And so, uh, but we need to, to, to be at the point where you can start to write songs in an organic way. You have to have prepared yourself well by immersing yourself in, um, in culture, in what we call like, you know, traditional wisdom, you know, I, I, and that's the best way I can really say it. Because I don't just sit down and say, because Ebenezer Obey, everybody, I hope you, you know Ebenezer Obey, the Juju musician. He wrote a song 
where this uh, people say is perhaps his most popular song, the one about the the us and the, like an us rider and his family and the us and you know people say it's, and people some people will tell me I've met musicians who will tell me I want to write a song like that. I'm like I don't know if you can just some people maybe some people are capable of doing that. Just say I want to write a song that will rival that song by Ebenezer Obey. But I don't operate like that, you know. I don't. I just let my songs come to me, and they come to me. So one, one of, the, in fact, the, the biggest way that my songs come to me is that direct, organic way. I don't know anything about it. The song just comes, and I write it down as a vessel for the people. But another way that songs come to me is when um, I get a melody, a tune in my head. Then I have to write words. I have to compose the words. Uh -huh. Then if there's an issue that's been bothering me, say maybe political situation in Nigeria, maybe uh, a, something happening around me amongst my friends, you know, and then I, I could use that opportunity. Since I have a melody, I could try to find the words uh, and arrange the words on the page to suit that melody. The other thing that happens is, say for example, one day I'm working, uh, okay, let me give you an example. Table Stone, one of our more popular songs too. The young man standing laughing, but he knows where the shoe they pay now. So there was actually a young man and I was driving from Ikoye, I think, to Ikeja. And I was coming through that Maryland area and we were in the traffic jam. And there was a young lad standing by like um, a pole. I don't know what that pole was, but he stood there and he's, he had his, his hand like that. And he was watching all of us in our cars. Yeah, and it was just, and I, and that song just came to me, just watching him like that in that traffic jam. And I started writing it. Since my car was not moving anyway, I started writing, young man standing laughing, you know. And I, I and I, so sometimes that's how oh, you write a song. But if you are true to yourself, what you have written will come out like a story. Like a story. Because what, when we say a story, it means, there's a smoothness to the flow. But when you try to write it inorganically, inorganically, eh, it will come out disjointed. And uh, that's what happens when people say, I find it hard to tell stories in music. How do you tell stories in music? You tell stories in music because your purpose is honest, because you have given yourself in, you've given yourself totally in to the impulse to take over you and control you. You know, and then the writing, and you're not writing because you are trying to find a hit song. That's another thing that a lot of people who do music, or even writers, they're looking for that big book, right? Yeah, you're thinking if I get the right agent in Europe or North America, if I do this, this thing and that, and then this is what they want me to write about. Hmm? The right publisher. Yes, the right publisher, yeah. And this is, these are the themes that they want us to write. Then you write it because you, and then you write like a particular person and you have a formula. And maybe that works for some people. But for most people, that will not work. What will work is you being yourself and writing stories that come from inside, stories that reflect who you are, stories that reflect yes. the truth. Your Thank head. You. So I hope, uh, that, I don't know if that satisfies. Yes, you. yes. Yes, it satisfies my question. And, and lastly, I, I'd really like to talk about. Um, Sounds from the small room, running tales from the small room. I, I'd okay. like you to share, you know, a bit more about the album. Just share with us how that was conceived, because I know that is like your most recent album. And just to give us maybe something that sort of sounds like um, the perspective to that that sound, because it okay. took it well, took a while, yeah. Yeah, what okay. we've done, what we've done over the years, and we have seventeen studio albums starting yes. with uh, Seven Lives in 1997 to yes. Sounds of Joy in 2019. And then I think about five years ago, you know, I started thinking of just releasing songs because you know, sometimes when I perform, I perform solo, just me and my guitar. And as I started thinking, I should do a few songs that are just me and my guitar and maybe some percussion, just to show people how these songs are before I record them with my band. Because there's a different vibe when I record yes. with the full complement, yes, of the band. Mm -hmm. There's a different vibe. But when I do it on my own, you can see the true 
hard. Like there's no embellishment. It's just raw the way it came to me, you know, the way. Um, so it's just my voice, an acoustic guitar playing rhythm. Uh, and then there's just some percussion there to give it. And that just takes you back to the earliest roots of my music. Because when I started writing songs, uh, it was basically, I, I didn't know how to play guitar. I didn't know how to play the keyboard or piano, but I knew how to drum. And almost all of us know how to drum. Okay. And I, I could beat my chest. Eh? I could sing something like, uh, uh, let's say, in my journey through the world, over land and over sea. See, you can do that. And that's how I used to play. Mm -hmm. That's how I used to do it when I was a kid. <laughs> how many years have so, Can I go on? Yes, sir, you can go on. I yeah. don't know where that came from. Yeah, so that's how I um, started, actually, when I was writing songs, when I was like... 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, until I was like um, in my 20s when I started playing the guitar more. I was usually just percussion based. So I wanted my audience to feel that, that when I write these songs, this is actually how they tend to sound at the beginning before I bring the band in there. And, but what I found was that a lot of people now tell me they actually prefer those albums. And there are five of them now. They, I started with uh, Tales from a Small Room, and then there was more Tales from a the Small albums. Room. Mm -hmm. And then it became uh, even more Tales from a Small Room. And then it just goes on and on like that, you know? So, oh. so we have like five of them now, yeah. And um, the latest one, I think, is Brand New Tales from a Small Room. And basically what I'm doing is picking some of our most popular songs and giving them that acoustic treatment just to, show, just to strip away all the embellishment and let people see. And if people can like it in that raw form, it shows you where the beauty of the song is coming from. It's not coming from the ons. It's not coming from all the extra things you put in there. It's coming from the words and the rhythm. You know, and those rhythms, you can say they are individual to Beautiful Nubia, but they are ancient rhythms. They are the rhythms of our lives. And that is why we can listen to them and like those songs. Because those songs, you, you can hear rhythms that are, it's like, okay, let me give you an, an example that I'm always telling people. When an African starts to sing reggae or soul okay, or jazz, many, if as an African, if you do a reggae album or a soul album or a jazz album, you send it to uh, um, uh, reviewers in Europe and North America. You know, they always like to do this condescending thing where they say, it sounds like this artist, it sounds like that artist. And then you have to tell them, do you know why Africans find it easy to love reggae music and play reggae music? Because there's the rhythm in there that in a way, eh, genetically, they can connect with. Because the roots, the roots of all these so-called modern genres of music are in African rhythms, African folk rhythms. You start picking them, the blues, R&B, soul, jazz, rock, anything you can, the roots of all those genres are from Africa, African folk rhythms. Huh? So it's either or I mean, there are many of them. And all those, and as an African, when you hear all this stuff, and it can be Bob Marley playing it, or it can be Marvin Gaye playing uh, his uh, soul, or it can be, uh, I don't know, somebody playing rock music, whoever it is, you may not, as an African, really be able to put your finger on it, but something there will connect with you. And you will think, and, and then if you do an album that is like that, there was, you know, all these reviewers will start saying, oh, it's an African trying to sound like a white person, but that's not true. Or an African trying to sound like an African-American. But I think the reason why Africans tend to like all this kind of stuff is because those ancient rhythms are reflected maybe at a very superficial level, but they are reflected in all those kind of music. And so uh, if, if we can connect with those ancient rhythms and if we can come humbly to music, come humbly to it and submit ourselves to the impulse and then be ready to learn 
and be ready to just start and keep evolving and keep and not be frustrated by lack of progress, uh, lack of celebration. Because if people don't celebrate you, and that's one of the biggest things that happen to artists. People don't celebrate you early enough. You start thinking, maybe I'm in the wrong place. Maybe I need to give it up. You know, if we can just be resilient, and those are all the traditional values that I must already, you know, because if you can be, if you can persevere and just stay on your path and just keep going, knowing that eventually when you submit yourself to the art and submit yourself to the impulse, uh, things are going on inside that you, you think you've created something great now, but you are going to create even greater things. And for me, we can celebrate Uwe Olojo, Jangbala Jubu, that big album. That was a big album. Huh? It's a big, big album. And then Ferre was a big, big album. Enyajo was a big, big album. Blah, 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 blah. We can keep counting them. But every moment, I keep thinking to myself, as long as I'm alive, I'm not looking for a, a great album. I just want to do the right thing. But I always have that feeling that I might still be able to do things that are even nicer than those things. And that is, you know, you have to, as long as you keep immersing yourself in it, you know, things are going to happen for us. But it's important that we, if we're artists are the life force, they are the soul of society. And artists need to take that position. Many of us tend to uh, turn ourselves into, into tools in the hands of politicians, tools in the hands of people who say they are the philosophers of society, they are the activists. Yes, sir, I can hear yeah. you. Yeah. So many Hello? of us like to submit ourselves okay. to these people and let ourselves be used as tools. But an artist is not, it's not arrogance. An artist is the soul of society. And we have to position ourselves in that way by respecting what we do, by not doing what we do for food, for money, for wealth, for material possessions, but by doing it for the greater good, by doing it because what we do enriches society. And, and the, the reward of the artist is not in that momentous celebration. No, the reward is in the fact that your works, your words, your melodies, even though I say your, you know they're not really yours, right? But the things that you have produced, all those things, your reward is in the fact that they will continue to bless generations to come. And that you are part of this tapestry of, 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 of uh, in what defines um, the human experience and that you've done your part of it and you've done it well. And I think as long as one yes. has that feeling that you're doing that job, that you're part of something really great and you're doing that job, I think every day you will find a sense of fulfillment and you will find the yes, courage sir. to keep going. You will find the inspiration to keep improving. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. I like that was magnificent. Thank you so much for your Thank you. time. Thank you so much for sharing um, all that you shared with us. Really, it's been a very awesome um, session with you. I, I really like that if anyone has questions, they send it to the moderator as soon as possible. And then that those questions are like compiled so that we can ask you. Thank you so much, sir. So like you can send in the chat box, um, Thanks to Dr. Shagwan Kinulu for his session. Um, and if you have questions, please send it to the chat box. Yes. So, um, yes. So, um, Dr. Akinulu is leaving us soon. So, you can send your questions now, please. If you can send your questions now, if you have any questions before we progress and go on to the next panelist. I'm going to count five seconds. No question. Okay. Okay. I'm just hearing gratitude. Thank you. Okay. So we have questions later on. I'm just going to probably probably just compare it and send it to him. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing your time with us. Um, if there's any um, question later on, I'm going to forward them to you. And we would definitely love to have you on more sessions later on. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, everyone. Thank you.
enjoy the rest of the session. Thank enjoy you. It. And if I if I get any questions, I will uh, reply people individually. Thank you so much. And thank you, DK. Wonderful work. Thank wonderful work you are doing. <laughs> I, know, I think we met. Uh, we might have met in Abuja briefly. I think. For yes, I went there. Yes, we did. Thank yes, you. Uh -huh. For like uh, that was like a, a music and event. But I don't think we had a chance to actually chat. It's good I to think see you again. We are going on stage. After yeah. all these years. <laughs> it's yeah. lovely. But I see I see your work yes. all the time. Yeah. And I think <laughs> I know I'm always happy. It's beautiful, beautiful to see it. We need more people like you. We need we need a lot of artists who are, you know, trying to uh, what do you call it now? Bring Eh? bring sanity to our scattered heads. It's so important. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Ayo. Thank you, my brother. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, sir. <laughs> so I'm going to go on to the next panelist. I'm going to start off from, like I was going to start off at the beginning, stealing off a line from their, um, one of their lines that they've used before in, in a piece. Okay. So I'm going to start off like this. I am a poet. So I will begin with lines from a poem that I've read from a very prolific poet and, and writer that redefines humanity with his words. Do not say I am a Morocco when the forest is burning. Do not say I'm an Ibiche when the forest is burning. Our differences will not prevent us from perishing together. So when the drums sound, let everybody answer. That is a poem, a piece of a poem from DK Chukumireji is with us presently. Good evening, sir. The poem is The Revolution Has No Pride. Good evening, sir. It's really great to have you on the panel. Good evening, Victoria. Thank you for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see you. Um, so briefly, I'm just going to ask um, why you wrote that poem. Because that that is one of you know the strongest poems that you've written in a long um, uh, well not what I, I wouldn't say the strongest but has carried so much embrace with so many people and people just keep talking about it talking about it. You wrote that poem, and I would like to know why you wrote it first and if it's still relevant, you know, in pre present society. Because that poem was in a way telling us that if we would born. If we would choose a side, if we would choose a side, then it would still not be relevant to choose a side. We would have to we'd still bond together despite if we just choose a tribe or an ethnicity and just say, okay, I'm on this side. But when trouble comes, trouble carries all of us. It's like a collective embrace. So I'd like to ask why you wrote that poem and if it's still relevant in, in today's Africa, in today's Nigeria, because I feel that it's one of the reasons why um, you shared that. You shared that form. Yeah. Can you hear me? Thank you for the question. Uh, I can hear you clearly, and I hope you okay, can sir. hear me clearly as well. Yes, I can. I can hear you clearly. Okay. Good. So thank you for the poem. The the or the question. Uh, the poem you referenced uh, is titled, I wrote it to address the issue of tribalism. Uh, in our society, because I, uh, is the, is the cancer, you know, it's, it's the cancer we need to root out of the Nigerian uh, system. That it's our, it's our, deepest problem. Uh, tribalism is the reason why we are not all able to come together to tackle the issues that affect us all. You know, so you have an unemployed graduate in Kano, or you have an unemployed graduate in Kano, you have an unemployed graduate in Lagos, but they're not able to connect on the basis of their common on employment because the one in Lagos sees himself or herself as Yoruba and the one in 
Kano sees himself as the reason they're never able to come together and tackle uh, unemployment. So you have these situations where if uh, a southerner is in power, uh, while the southerner is in power, that is in, uh, feels obliged to keep quiet, you know, or make excuses for the misgovernance going on. While everybody in the north will suddenly begin to complain about how bad the government is and how bad things are. But then the moment a northerner comes into power, the condition won't change. The poverty will still be there, the unemployment will still be there, but then the northerner because of tribalism, will suddenly feel obliged to start making excuses for the Northern in power, while the South that had previously been making excuses will now start complaining vigorously. So at no point in time do you have a unified uh, approach to our problems. When one side is complaining, the other side will be condoning. When the other side starts complaining, this side will start condoning because of tribalism. I often tell people that it's very strange that you would have uh, two people living side by side in a low income area. I live in Abuja, so maybe you have two people living in, on the outskirts of the city uh, in Cairo or in Lube or somewhere. Uh, one of them is Igbo, the other one is Yoruba, and they are next door neighbors. They live in the same bacha, uh, you know, same one room, face me, I face you, come out in the morning, jump over, open gutters, enter bus, sit in the same bus, sit in the same traffic. These two people live, live side by side, Igbo and Yoruba. Yet the Igbo man living in that condition in Lube will feel that he has more common, if he has more in common with an Igbo man who lives in a highbrow area, maybe in Asukuru, who lives in some seven bedroom mansion, is able to fly out to London on weekends, you know, uh, has seven cars, can afford to send his children to school abroad. This Igbo man living in Lube, living in the face me, I face you with his Yoruba neighbor, will feel that he has more in common with this Igbo guy living in Asukuru that can fly abroad. And has less in common with his own neighbor with whom he shares an actual socioeconomic experience every day, an actual socioeconomic reality every day. Reality. And what's the reason for this? Tribalism, that we have, so, we have been so deeply socialized into these tribalistic ways of thinking that will rather fight for uh, people from our tribe to be, uh, somebody from our tribe to be appointed as minister of education, will rather fight for that than fight that the local school in our village is more effective. Will rather fight that a member from our ethnic group becomes minister of health and fight that the primary health center in our village has drugs, has you know, doctors, nurses, is actually saving lives. So, so we've been so indoctrinated that we'll rather fight for these symbolic uh, victories of one region than fight for the betterment of our own lives, of the lives of our children, of our parents. You know, so tribalism to me is almost like a curse. It's almost like Somebody did juju for you and you're not seeing clearly again. And tribalism is different from cultural pride, you know, to be proud of your culture. You know, it's a different thing. Tribalism is when you're not able to see clearly because you are so fixated uh, on these uh, ethno-regional uh, mathematics that we play. And so uh, I wrote that poem uh, shortly after I had finished my my master's, I did a master's degree in law and development where I spent at concept of development, trying to answer the question, why are some countries third world and other countries first world? Why is Africa so different? And we had studied all kinds of 
think the laws, the you know, I came to the companies, the culture, the culture, the the at the approach to problems, the mentality, you know, and at the heart of that mentality is this tribalistic mindset. And and so I wrote that poem, The Revolution Has No No Tribe, to try and show people that if you are uh, traveling from Lagos to Ibado on a road that the government has refused to fix the bus, and that bus enters a pothole and tumbles, it is not only the Yoruba people in the bus that will die. It's not only the Igbo people in that bus that will die, or the Fulani people. Everybody will be affected by it. We're just, we're living in a pandemic now, COVID. Thank God that somehow it's not been as deadly in, in Africa, in Nigeria, as it's been in the rest of the world. But if this had been a lethal virus, you can imagine the havoc it would wreak in Nigeria because frankly, we have no defenses because of corruption and bad governance. And the havoc it will wreck, it will not, skip Bauchi state and just do Gumbi, or skip only the Christians and just do the Muslims, it would affect everybody. Same thing with unemployment, same thing with insecurity. I mean, look at what's happening now in the country with this herder farmer crisis. This is again an also, example of how tribalism, you know, really hurts us, this herder farmer crisis, uh, also, otherwise known as Fulani, headsmen and all that. This is a crisis that starts said, sorry? Yeah, I can hear you, I can hear you. Um, can't say I can hear you. Okay. Now this is a crisis that started almost 10, 12 years ago, you know, in the Northwest, in Zamfara. But because at the time, there was no ethno-religious dimension to it. It was Alsa Fulani Muslim, Muslim, Alsa Fulani Muslim violence on Alsa Fulani Muslims. So Alsa Fulani Muslims were the only ones affected. So the rest of the country didn't pay attention. It didn't interest us. In the South, it just felt like they are there killing themselves. It's not our business. But because mm-hmm. we didn't pay attention, the fire continued to spread and began to spread south. You know, from Zamfara, it entered Kaduna, from Kaduna, it entered Benue. It was until it crossed the ethno-religious line that suddenly everybody started talking about, oh, Muslims are killing Christians and mischaracterized the crisis as a Muslim-Christian crisis, as opposed to what it really is. A religious crisis. Tribalism ties, it, it just stops us from dealing with problems objectively, efficiently, quickly. And so those problems escalate. Uh, so um, I wrote that poem, um, The Revolution Has No Tribe, just to point that out as my own contribution. You know, like uh, beautiful Nubia was saying, uh, not everybody has to be a conscious artist. You know, if your if your your own calling is to entertain, then by all means entertain. But if as an artist you find that you feel that you're, you're drawn towards advocacy, conscientizing, mm-hmm. you know, then that's mm-hmm. what you have to do. You know, so I'm an that artist that has been, I'm not drawn at mm-hmm. all towards entertainment. I, I see my art as, as a way of addressing my society. I feel that art is a very powerful weapon because when the artist speaks, the artist is able to speak to the heart, you know, to bypass logic and reason and speak to the heart. And for a society like Nigeria, where many times when you look, we, we always seem to be saying the right thing. Our leaders most of the time when they are talking, they seem to be saying the right things, and yet nothing changes, you know, because the, the talk is superficial. 
it doesn't it doesn't it's not really coming from the heart so there's also a heart problem you know that the artist is well placed to address you know to speak to the heart of nigerians our tribalism is rooted in our hearts it's really rooted in our hearts uh, it's prejudice it's akin to racism and and you have to speak to the heart to try and to try and cure it of that ailment so that's why i wrote the poem Victoria, are you still there? I, I forgot I was muted. Thank you so much for sharing that perspective, you know, with us and bringing some more light to that poem. And somehow for creatives, it's, well, in an open space, it's always a shared perspective that the world's greatest writers are those who, yeah, I'm with you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, okay. Okay, okay. So it's a shared perspective that the world's, um, best, greatest writers, uh, those, one, those ones who, while fully recognizing the importance of their native language, you know, and their culture, they proceed to take that cultural embrace from what is unique to them to a universal concept, like a universal concept. So I wanted to ask, you know, in your perspective, what is the connection between culture and literature? Culture is, is a great source of, of inspiration for, for literature. Um, I mean, we've just spent an hour listening to an artist who you know, has done so well at mining his culture, you know. Uh, so it's, it's a great source of, of inspiration. It's a great source of stories. It's a great source of metaphors, figures of speech. Uh, because one of the things that we try to do as artists is to say what you are familiar with, but in a way that makes you feel like you're hearing it for the first time. You know, so I'm, I'm saying what you know already, but I'm saying it in a fresh way. And often to do that, it means that I have to find new or fresh metaphors, fresh figures of speech, fresh phrases and turns of expression to use to characterize that, that point or that issue. And this is where uh, having access or being fluent in subcultures that are not mainstream becomes very becomes very helpful for you as an artist. Uh, because when I'm, when I'm fluent in subcultures that are not mainstream, then I can go to the subcultures to, to bring out expressions or phrases or terms of expression that you don't regularly hear. So that when I, when I say it, then it's fresh. It just sounds really uh, fresh. It's just a new way of saying something. Yeah. You know? Um, okay. So in that sense, culture is very important for, for us uh, writers. Um, often, on the, when you sit at the table, on a global table with writers from all over the world, you know, what stands you out is your unique culture, the, the unique cultural flavor you bring to what you're saying. You know, I'm someone who believes that ultimately, truth is universal you know there's you know it's universal yes. it, it it's universal to the human condition but the way you say it the, the rhythm with which you say it the figures of speech with which you say it can be particular to your culture you know so that's what you really bring as an artist the the lengths 
the lenses through which you view things and, and the Science. ways in which you see. Yeah, so that, that, that's mm -hmm. what makes culture very important in the arts. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that perspective. But also, I'd like to chip this question in briefly because I, I believe that as a spoken word artist, spoken word artist, you've had multiple experiences with different spaces, different cultures, moving from different locations to another, with simple, simply poetry and um, stage plays that you started back in the day. I, I would want you to sincerely tell us what is one of the biggest challenges that you have faced as a spoken artist and performer in today's Africa. Because I remember that when you started Simply Poetry, you said that you wanted to create a consciousness within um, the literary space and also within you know, the society of poetry and make people understand poetry better, make people see the depths, the depths and the um, originality, the message that you can pass across with poetry. So I'd like to say that I, I'd like to say over, over the years, you had so much experience. What would you say is the biggest challenge that you have experienced over time? The biggest challenge uh, is always funding. <laughs> it's always money. <laughs> You know, uh, it sounds very mundane, yeah. but it's always, it's always the money to put things together. Uh, particularly when you're working in a space mm -hmm. that uh, people are not very familiar with. So uh, this is not music, you know, this is not even traditional drama. So at the beginning, I used to struggle to even ex explain to people what it is. You know, I didn't have a definition. You know, so I would I would say it's 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 poetry on stage, okay. it's spoken word theatre, you know, and in the end I'll say just come and see it for yourself. Poetry. Yeah, you know, just come and see it for yourself. And in fact, <laughs> uh, because of this problem, my first four shows were free. You know, there were no tickets. Just come and see it. Uh, because I I felt like I had to create, create a demand, the demand, the mm -hmm. the product. So I had to introduce you know, exactly it, and they're like, "Oh wow, you know, when are you doing this again? Or when can we come?" It was it was feedback from the audiences that came the first four times for the free shows and. This was over two and a half years, you know, I was, I was doing a show twice every year, you know. So over two and a half years, there was a feedback from that audience that said, look, this thing is really fantastic. You need, you need to put it, you need to start charging. And tickets. Price on it. Mm -hmm. that, yeah, that gave me the courage to actually start charging tickets for it. At the beginning, it was so experimental, you know, it was really, really experimental. So that was my biggest challenge, just... Because whenever you say poetry, people just think Shakespeare, you know, <laughs> or they think of they think of Walesho Inca, but not even the accessible Walesho Inca. They think of the inaccessible Walesho Inca. That is the most when he's at his most difficult. So they think it's going to be something very tedious. I won't understand it. I can't okay. enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's only for very deep people. You know, that was the impression that people had of, of poetry. And then when you said spoken word, people immediately thought of African-American or, or sort of the rap culture, the, mm -hmm. you know, sort of this, something akin to rap, you know. And yet that's not what I'm doing. So I'm neither doing what you think of as poetry, neither am I doing what you, then what people would think of as spoken word because their mind will go to Tupac and Biggie and all these things. So it was very hard to, to define, you know? So I would end up saying, just come and see. And it, that was how Simply Poetry was able to grow, by, by demonstrating and testing what we're doing on an actual audience. And people began to understand that. Uh, and then you also get a lot of pushback from from the poetry industry, you know, because I felt that, or I wanted to write poetry that everybody could connect to, 
that was accessible at some level to, to my local environment. I, I was writing poetry for the person beside me. So I wanted yeah. to use expressions. I wanted to use phrases that they used every day. I wanted to use ordinary language to write poetry. And there were some poets who felt that this is not, poetry is supposed to be mysterious. Poetry is supposed to be difficult to understand. Poetry is supposed to be opaque, you know? So you also get pushed back from those people. So it was, it was, that was the greatest challenge, overcoming these mindsets. You know, what? Well, like beautiful Nubia said, and it's a very important point, that you, you, have to, you have to be driven by something deeper than the need for an applause or an immediate applause something deeper than the need for immediate recognition and fame and money, you know, particularly when you are an experimental artist, you have to be dri driven by a deeper purpose and you have to have and trust that there is a time and place for everything. That if you, if you are consistent, if you keep, you know, applying yourself to this thing and pushing it eventually, it will break that glass ceiling, you know. So from the very beginning, yeah. I invested in quality. I invested in my content. I didn't invest so much in my packaging. I just invested in my content. Again, like he said about the simplicity of the rhythm and the, and the lyrics and how in the end, that's what the magic is in. Yeah. And so with the show that I travel around the country with, you know, we don't have any sparkling or dazzling lights or effects or whatever it is. What we've been to, we've staged the show over 23 times, 11 or so states in the country, from, from Meduguri to Lagos to River State to Plateau. We've gone all over the country. And everywhere we've gone, with every audience, regardless of its ethno-religious makeup, with every audience, we've been able to connect very deeply. We've had people laughing, we've had people crying, we've had people inspired, you know, and it's a very simple show because we put all the effort into creating mm -hmm. deep, real, meaningful content, you know, so the magic is not in the lights or in the you know, pyrotechnics or whatever, the magic is in the words. You know, so so that 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 was the challenge overcoming those mindsets. But slowly, we've been making progress in terms of getting people to appreciate poetry or see poetry in a new light. Sorry for the short glitch. Sorry. Sorry. So um, I, I would also want to ask, because you mentioned um, telling stories and telling true poetry, um, stories that would connect to your local community, you know, using words, rhymes, that would make people see and be able to understand poetry in the simplest forms. And you've been able to share a little bit, you know, I would, I would want to quote someone and say, everybody shares a little bit of themselves in their works. So you'd want to share a little bit of your, of the things that you hold there, your cultural background in your works. And I watched some of your videos and, you know, most times I hear you quote Chino Achibe at the beginning of your, you know, poetry, your works. And then I feel okay, that has a deep connection to how you started reading literature and you started probably from his works and all that stuff how how do you believe or how do you think that people can bring cultural storytelling to poetry now i read a lot of works i'm a poet myself and sometimes when you write when you write works you when you read works in the present um, poetry space you read a lot of love grief um heartbreak a lot of things, they are beautiful things, but it's very hard for you to find works with this cultural depth or with this sense that you read and you're like, mm, I can connect this or I can 
see another person's culture through this form. So how do you believe that we can revive cultural storytelling through poetry and um, expand that niche in itself? Okay. Um, I know I could actually a lot. Well, let me put it this way. The works in which I have quoted him have gone, you know, have traveled for a, a lot, you know. Um, yes. <laughs> let me put it that way, because I, I don't quote him a lot, actually. But I, I know that some, of, some places where I've quoted him and seem to have traveled a lot. Um, and he, he is not, you know, I, I didn't start performing poetry because of Achibi. And that honor belongs to my elder brother, uh, Che, who, uh, you know, used to write poetry and music. Yes, and yes, I just wanted to be like him. So that's, that's how I got into this okay. sort of creative space. That's one, two. Um, I'm Igbo and I am proud of my culture. Uh, however, I'm also Nigerian. I have I have a very on, on maybe I don't I don't think it's a mainstream view, but I'm not one of those who thinks that Nigeria is that there's no there's nothing like a Nigerian culture and Nigerian identity. There's only it's only our ethnic identities that are real, you know. So you cannot, you know, you cannot be Nigerian. You can only be Igbo or Yoruba. Also. And Nigeria is just, you know, some lifeless sort of national identity. I, I, that's not how I, I think. You know, I, I have. I'm very in touch with my Nigerianness, and the Nigerian culture is alive within me, and it's because of my up upbringing. So I'm Igbo, but I was born in Lagos. I grew up in Lagos, you know, and then um, now I'm living in Abuja, which is the North. Uh, I've never actually lived in the East. I, I, I visit regularly. I, from a child, from, from childhood, I would go back to my village every Christmas, spend two, three weeks and things like that. You know, so, these amalgam of cultures are alive within me. And that is really what, that is the cultural melting pot that I tap into as a poet, not just my own ethnic culture, but the melting pot of Nigerian culture. Uh, so I use Nigerian English because I feel, I, believe, I know that there is a, a brand of English that is Nigerian. English in, in a sense is a Nigerian language because we've colonized it. And there's a way we speak English here that is very different from the way it's spoken in, in the UK or in America or anywhere else in the world. And I'm very uh, interested in, in drawing from that cultural melting pot uh, and not just from my own uh, ethnic culture. Um, so that's one, that's two, you know, in terms of, so you can be speaking English and still be drawing on culture and still be using culture in your art yeah, because you are, you are speaking the peculiar version of English, you know, that, that flourishes here in Nigeria, you know? So that, that's also important to, to bring that uh, to into our art, you know. So, for instance, I have a poem titled "My Mother Was a Chiquito," you know. Uh, and just using the word "chiquito," for instance, you know, it's a Nigerian word. And by the time I start performing the word, you know, I'm just, I just flavor it with Niger what we call just that Niger identity, Niger feel. But thirdly, um, whenever I go into my ethnic culture, what I am interested in is in universalizing it. I want people 
when I, when I reference Igbo culture, I want them to see their values in the values within my ethnic group. I'm interested in building bridges across ethnicities and across cultures. So whenever I reference Igbo culture, I want you to find in it as a Yoruba person, something that you can relate with, something that makes you think, ah, we have something like this in Yoruba. We have a saying like this in Yoruba. Yes. Well, we have yeah. a recognition like this in, in Yoruba culture, in Fulani culture, in Alsa culture. Because like I said, truth is universal. Truth is universal. Yes. We just interpret it through our cultural lenses. So whenever I dip into my own Igbo culture, if I reference, uh, maybe I, I say something in Igbo, or I reference something in Igbo, my own objective as an artist is to show you a universal value, a value that you can connect with, regardless of where you're coming from. Because my objective all the time is to make the underlying point that regardless of ethnicity or religion, we share a common humanity, you know? So I use yes. culture proactively. There are some people that use culture to divide. They proactively use mm. references to culture to divide, to separate, to segregate, to make themselves special and other, other people not special. But that's not how I use culture. Mm. I use culture to build bridges because that's what connect. I am passionate about. I just call it to connect and um, bring everybody together, creates like a coalition of individuals. And that is so beautiful. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing a perspective. I'm going to drag Mr. Taiwo Ebinjobi to the panel now, because I, I was, I'm going to quote him briefly from um, something that he said a few weeks ago. And um, said, is Satara with us? Can you stay with us? Alessa. Yes, good Hello. evening. Great okay, session sir. so far. Can you hear you? Yes, sir. So, yes, sir. So, um, thank you so much, Mr. D.K. Chikumiriji. I, I want to bring him to the panel because I'm going to cut in briefly. He said that I don't want to be the kind of filmmaker that would be able to make film in a single way and in a single language of filmmaking. So I want to understand you know, how as a person, as a creative, you are able to create works that very inform, you know, works that are able to, to carry um, what is, and what Mr. Dike said, um, the cohesion of cultures, carry your own message, carry different messages together and translates to, um, to a film or to livelihood. So how do you create a coercion? Because you said that you cannot create works that carry a single language of filmmaking. So I want to know if that is possible. Okay, so what I meant when I said that was that um, there are, it's an, first of all, like everybody has said on the panel so far, uh, your heart's an expression really of who you are. And, um, for many artists that I've huh? seen, they are able to choose. Can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear, yes, you, I can hear you now. Okay, good. Yes. So I yes. mean, so for many artists, I mean, they are able to stick to a particular language. So you look at someone like Tunde Kelani. Tunde Kelani is always going to tell his stories uh, in a very Yoruba context, using a very Yoruba context. That is Tunde Kelani style. Uh, you know, but some of us are not like that. Some of us uh, have acquired different languages because of the kind of things we'd be exposed to. Um, Tunde Kelani is we is because that's how he was born. That's what he's learned about himself. That's how he grew as an artist. He was exposed to a kind of art and that's who he is. He, there's no second Tunde Kelani. Anybody that tries to be like him is going to fail because his heart's an expression of who he is. And I've met him and I can attest to that as an example. So I've been exposed to different art forms. As a child, I watched films from Russia. I watched films from America. I watched films from Nigeria. And so I believe that um, what I want to say with my story is, uh, is, is um, stories are universal. So, but I can use a different cinematic language to tell that story. 
And, you know, that will get us into style. What, what style am I using? Are we going for a narrative? Are we going for non-narrative? Are we going for linear or non-linear story? Are we going for meditative? Or are we going for something okay. um, that is not meditative, that is just clear? Are we going for something in the musical? Are we doing like a documentary? So you can use various languages, cinematic languages to tell your story because stories are universal. Uh, stories are universal. Uh, your medium, however, affects the audience. A story you, you wrote a song about instead will be perceived differently or by new audiences if you made it, made it as a film. And so that's what you do when you are able to um, take the same essence that every artist has, which is your story. So Mr. DK could write that same thing in his poem. And I would say, okay, I'm going to adapt that poem into a film. That's me um, using a different artistic language uh, to tell that particular story. And within film, we also have different, different languages. Uh, a lot of it is out of how I've grown, what I saw when I was growing up, my own personal identity as an artist, and also what I've learned, which is my identity, basically, you know. So that comes into it, and that's really where the personal flavor gets into it. So I hope I answered that question. Yes, sir, and I, I really love the way that you answered it. I know that you love Tunde Kilani and that you respect his works a lot. I've heard you quote him quite some times, and you just did quote him um, in, your, in, your, in your answer to that question. And I'd, I'd like to say that there was a point that you mentioned that you do not like to be niche focused. I don't know if that is right. To focus on okay. a niche, you'd like to explore different art forms and uh, yeah. I'm not sure. Right, so that, okay, so th yes. that's a discovery so, I made. Okay. okay. Yeah, go on. Yes, yes, yes. I'd like for you to expand on that actually. Okay. That how as, okay. as a filmmaker, you want to focus. Okay. okay. So as a storyteller, I mean, I always tell people to do what I call a self-discovery process. And self-discovery is when you really look at yourself and what you have and the things you want to do. And this is what I am. This is who I am. So first of all, I'm a Nigerian. And I agree with Mr. Dickie. I don't hold on to ethnic. Um, I mean, I believe a lot in my being a Yoruba person, but I also believe in Nigeria. So that's me. And because I even have that simple perspective, it therefore means that I'm going to break from what my Yoruba nationalist friends will usually say. You know, so what am I saying? Since I'm saying that um, I don't want to stay in a niche because as a person, I'm not a niche person. I was born in Kenya, but I found myself in Nigeria after three years. Uh, I didn't like mathematics. I liked reading poetry. Uh, literature as a child. I didn't used to study anything that had to do with science. All I wanted to do was just read books, you know? So I started writing and making comics when I was very young, you know? So as, as a child, I was never someone who you could place in a single category. I mean, you could call me a professor, but I was also a troublemaker when I was young. I used to steal meat from the pots. I used to, you know, and you see, see me, being the guy in church, studying the Bible and just being a serious guy. I hope everybody can hear me because I'm like, it's all gone silent. Hello. We can hear you. We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. okay, thank you. All right. So, I mean, that's how I started evolving. So I've never been someone who you could really capture in a single, uh, box and say, oh, he's, he's, a, he's a Yoruba boy. Oh, he's a, he's, space. a he's an Ibadan boy. Oh, he's a, so that has, is, is now reflecting. I'm not saying that's the only way to work, but that is now reflecting on my work. I don't see myself doing films in one particular with my first film in Ibadan. It was a meditative film that is so slow, feels like a poem at times. My second film is entirely non-meditative. Rough and people are running up and down at every single point in time. You know, and my third film is probably going to be different. I'm moved by the things that are inside my heart 
and the stories that I want to tell, and I feel I can tell them with any language that I want to use. But what I've still discovered, even though I don't want to be in a niche, what I've discovered about my work is something I tweeted last week on Twitter. Niche or I, had for... I watched, mm-hmm. I watched two of my first films, and I saw certain similarities. Even though I wasn't trying, I, I avoid being mm-hmm. in, a niche, in a niche. But I started seeing certain similarities. I saw myself. I mean, I shot a scene the same way in these two different movies. You know, same way. So even though you tried, I, I'm trying to avoid to be in a niche, my personal voice is still shining through in any kind of uh, project that I do. So that is that, is that about uh, not being stuck in a niche. It's not the only way to work but it's how I, I work. And that's what is true to me. So that's my answer. I can't hear you again. Hello? I can't hear you. Hello. 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 Can you hear me? I yeah, can't hear so you. sorry for I don't I'm, I'm really so sorry. I don't even understand sometimes how this thing goes on. So I'm I'm going to go ahead to the next question. Um okay. I'm just going to ask something that I asked um Dr. Sadiqa Chikumariji on how First of all, I'd even like to pick into what you said, actually. You said that um, defining a niche in itself is not something that you would do. But do you believe that this is a challenge for every filmmaker to figure out? Do you believe that this is something that most people don't know? That, okay. um, yeah, this, I, I'm sorry, sorry, before you talk, I saw a question by um, Karibu. We're going to address the question later on. I'm just really going to... Okay, she's already, and um, Sadiq is already answering the question in the chat box. So I'm just going to go ahead. Please answer, um, give an answer to that. Do you believe it's a challenge, identity in itself, for every identifying filmmaker if it's a challenge? Of course, um, I think it's a challenge, and that's why our filmmaking industry is not um, exactly where it should be. Of course, I don't want to be too critical of what we are doing. So I think uh, it's not where it should be. Because, uh, it's not being the best um, ambassador for us from a cultural perspective. It has done a bit of that, but uh, you wouldn't exactly call it um, a perfect industry. And why that is so is because um, a lot of us are struggling with identity. Identity is something that you discover, like I said earlier, when you do a self-discovery, self-mapping, Who am I? Um, And it's so difficult to do that these days because frankly, we have, we live in a very Americanized society. I wouldn't even call it Westernized, I'll call it Americanized society. We grew up, I mean, most people grew up watching American films and there was a period period of time where parents just felt um, being American is is the greatest thing ever. And, you know, so they didn't teach their kids the, the mother tongue. They didn't even really care about that. And, they will. and so it's already a bit difficult in that context to really um, excavate something that is original. But what I would still say is that it's difficult because for you to carve that identity for yourself, you must call yourself to a dark room and really have that conversation with yourself. Who am I? Why am I here? And I don't Why know I where we are. Yeah, so I don't know if that is something that is very popular in my industry. I know most of the reasons why people work is to just make money. Uh, so hmm. the place of conversation with yourself never really emerges. I was lucky that I was mentored by people who, who don't, I mean, these people are, I mean, very successful filmmakers, but they never really told me about filmmaking being all about making money. They told me that filmmaking was about stories. 
And for you to be an effective storyteller, you need to be in connection with yourself. When you don't know who you are and you don't have uh, an anchor, so that, how that are you going to tell point. a story? Being, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How are you going okay, to tell okay, a story okay, okay. if you don't know who you are? How are you? Go, what are you? Go, what, what is your agenda? What is your? What are you looking at? And that's the, the problem. So people have not really had that conversation with themselves where they mapped out themselves. Okay, this is who I am. I am Taiwo Ibunjobi. I was born in Kenya, but I grew up in Ibadan. Uh, I, these are my values. You know, that's when you begin to identify values. You know, so but we, 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 we live in, in a society. I, I work in an industry where people don't really want to talk about values and they want to talk about the algorithm to success. How do I, um, how do I, become a successful filmmaker. And that's good. You need to be a successful filmmaker. You need to find a way to make your heart pay you. But honestly, like my mentor tells me, he says that your passport to global relevance is your culture. You know, and that's why my mentor is still relevant today. He's probably the most relevant Nigerian filmmaker currently. You know, and that is so true. That's why we have, um, I call it, in, I call it uh, mass approved films, films that you watch and you forget, films that have no um, lasting um, mm. lasting effects on Impact. people's lives, impacts on people's lives, and people do that. But I know they are really troubled because they really want to get to that point too, but it begins with the conversation you have with yourself. There's no single one so, way to be an artist. There's no single one way to be an African artist. Like I was going to say earlier, Africa itself, the word is a, is a Latin word. I mean, so an Africa is not a country. There are different identities within Africa. So you can literally say, I'm, I want to be the most African person. But what, what you, can be, you can be is to be true to who you are. You find out who you are yes, and so. you are true to who you are, true to yourself. And then that unique flavor comes out naturally. You don't need to... Let me give you an example. I... I, I'm, I mean, I, uh, I, I, my father was a very old man when he gave birth to me. So naturally, I enjoy all that things. So when you watch my films, some people say my characters talk like old people. And I, I, I read a lot of books. You know? So that is not me trying to be a vintage filmmaker. Or I'm trying to be an old type filmmaker. No, that's just me uh, expressing who I am. So that's why it's important. And it's a, it's a process of self-discovery. You need to take yourself aside and map yourself, oh. map who you are and map who you want to be because identity is also a work in progress. Identity is not simply something you stumble upon. When you have come to a point in your life as a person, they begin to say, okay, this is my culture. My culture may have some issues here. So this is what I am going to remove. This is what I'm going to add. I'm going to keep evolving myself, you know, Course, that's when culture begins to evolve, cultural development. I, I'm not a cultural romantic at all. I'm, I'm, anti, I'm anti cultural romanticism. I don't believe that uh, my culture is the best, or oh, your culture is not good. And I join people to say, oh, my culture, my culture. No, I'm always looking and having that dialogue with myself. How can my culture be better? How can I be a better person? That is a process that every artist needs to go through. I hope I've answered your question. Hello? I think we Hello. have any, Yeah, I hope I answered your question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, you did. Um, thank you so much for sharing that perspective and sharing the story. Um, I would like to ask a question that's going to go to both um, panelists um, here. As, as a creative, as a filmmaker, and as a poet, you have so many influences on your work, you know, and people would maybe, I don't know, because you have so much experience and you share time with other people in different locations, you have a number of influences on how your work would look like or what your work would um, surface as. How do you retain that unique feel, you know, present in your work? How do you retain what your works look like or what 
that uniqueness that you want your work to look like as a creative or as a poet, as a filmmaker. Mr. Dicky can go first and share your perspective. Um, how do you retain your uniqueness? I don't know if there's a, you know, there's a formula. Uh, everybody is unique. Retaining that, yeah. retaining that uniqueness and that present feeling in your work that is not totally influenced by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm saying that fundamentally, we are all, in, as individuals, we are we are unique. So allowing your own uniqueness to come through, uh, for me, it would be about. Uh, Following or following your your intuition, following your own deep inner feelings about the material you're working with, you know, having the courage to to listen inwards and follow your own instincts. Uh, sometimes it takes a while to to develop that courage, or or and. To, to hear your own inner voice clearly. Uh, it, it could take a while for you to recognize your own inner voice, which is part, when people say, find your voice, you know, about re recognizing your own inner voice. And then even if you can hear it and you know that this is what I really feel about this, it may take a while to find the courage if nobody else is going in that direction or nobody else seems to do see or feel what you feel, or would you have the courage to sort of follow it? So that the answer to that question really is about how in tune you are with yourself. Uh, many artists, well, I as an artist, I, I began, I started writing by copying. I told you my elder brother was a poet. So my first poems in quotes were just copying his own poems into my exercise book. Until he told me that that was plagiarism. I learned the word plagiarism at a very young age because he told me that that was plagiarism. I should stop doing it. He was very upset. <laughs> you know, but, you know, I needed to create. I think the one that was the point in creating when it's just there, I can just do it. <laughs> you know, but, so I graduated to. When I dub it, I'll change one sentence and I'll change one word. <laughs> mm, progress. <laughs> progress. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, just, I'll just put my own imprint on it somewhere. And from there, you know, began to develop. But many times innovation starts with imitation. You know, you start by you're imitating someone, you know, but along the, the line, you might now find that. You know, something within you wants to turn right, where that person always goes left. You know, so that's where you start sort of finding your voice and having the courage to follow your voice. So it's, it's just about being in tune with your own self and, uh, you know, hearing your own inner voice and having the courage to follow it. Uh, but let me see. I mean, Taiwo, what do you think? Oh, I think you're... I think you're very correct. I mean, uh, um, mm -hmm. I mean, you just said it very well. I, mean, I remember when I started making films, I wanted to immediately be like Sunday Kelani. And um, I tried it. I didn't like what I had. So I said, okay, maybe I'm not <laughs> going to be like him. So I started watching some strange Russian films and strange Polish films. And I felt I was going to be the next art director. So I started doing things in my film that, you know, I started editing in strange ways, you know, just doing strange things. If you, if you watch a lot of European films, you know, they, they have a very strange um, way they make it. They don't make narrative films. Sometimes you don't even know what's going on for an entire film. So I started copying those styles and I didn't enjoy it when I started watching it. And that's what when you spoke about the, uh, being true and discussing with yourself and being in tune with yourself. So I started iterating with different things. You know, I tried the first thing. I didn't like what I was seeing. I felt I obeyed everything my mentor, I mean, I copied everything my mentor did in this film, and yet I don't like what I'm saying. I don't enjoy it. I mean, I made the second 
third, fourth film, short film project, and I was copying European directors that I admired. Yet I wasn't liking it. Started writing like them in the films. It wasn't working. I was trying to put the cost words like Scorsese we do, try to put the Italian vibe that uh, you bring in, try to copy Tarantino writing the dialogue. With the it wasn't just working, but I kept iterating. So I kept, okay, this is not working. I don't enjoy this. And so I started listening more to myself. Okay. One of the biggest headaches I had, uh, let me just say the story, was when I wanted to make um, my film in English. Following my mentor of my life, he used to make a film in Yoruba language. And I always felt, be my mentor. And my, he has told me a lot about preserving the language, preserving it, and I believe that really. But I just felt, I mean, my stories, the stories that are coming to me were nationalistic. I mean, Yoruba, English, Pidgin, any kind of language. I wasn't thinking, and I was trying so hard to just include, and just had you, you make a Yoruba film, and it wasn't working. I was a, for a year, it was like a real crisis that who am I as an artist? Am I Tunde Kelani's part two, or am I Tawib Njobi who is still discovering himself? And it, when I, I fought that, and I, I, I fought that really, and I came out and said, I'm going to follow my own film and do my own film and do it my own way. And hopefully, he saw the film I made and he was even thanking me that, oh, this is good, this is good. You know, that he likes it, he likes it. He says, oh, that was your, your, your choices are strange here, but don't explain it to me. It's your thing, I respect you for doing what you're doing. You are my guy, you're my son, artistically, but you're not copying, and throwing everything I've done into your work. I respect that. And that's why I started knowing, okay, I don't need to be my Replicate. mentor. I don't need to acquire his ethic. I need to learn what he has to say, but I still need to find myself as an artist. So he's correct, Mr. Dick is absolutely correct when he says, we all have our uniqueness. Um, let me just quote one person. Bradford Young said, I mean, he's one of the greatest DPs working in America right now when it comes to filmmaking. He shot Mother of George, beautiful, Nigerian film in USA. And his short arrival too is a big DP, black. He said the reason, I mean, his films are always very dark. His films are always dark. Whether he's working for an American on an American, his films are always on that. Mm -hmm. And we ask, people ask him, why are your films? He says he grew up in a funeral home. His, parents, his grandparents were funeral. And so he sees darkness in a different way. He said when he was in film school, they didn't have enough light. Wow. So they have to manage with working with smaller lights. So to him, darkness became a device rather than a, than, than, than a problem. So also your, your, your problems, your limitations could also help you to find your uniqueness or could become your uniqueness, basically, when you learn how to work with them and you just become your own thing. So I think that's how it emerges in the process of you iterating, using what you have, listening to yourself, doing it again, repeat, repeat, then it, then it emerges. Uh Thank you so much for sharing our perspective. I'm so grateful that I have like a combination of you two on the panel because you brought different stories, different perspectives, and I've been able to gather a lot from this discussion. And I like that directly or indirectly, we were able to fix a message on identity and creating an identity for yourself. That is the last point of this conversation. Find yourself. To have an identity, you have to find yourself. You have to develop your heart from within, from your soul, from searching, from, find, from finding your dark spots or your lights, you know, just becoming yourself truly from the inside. I'm so grateful to um, Mr. DK and Mr. Tyro for sharing your time with us. If you have any questions, okay, I think we already have questions. I'm just going to read them um, so that we can... If you have questions, please send them in right now so I can share them with the panel. Um, so Bob Mayer is asking, you said to Mr. Dike, regardless of ethnicity and religion, we share a common humanity. Can you shed more light? Can you explain this, sir? Uh, um. By this, I mean that, you know, when a, when a child is born, when we are born, nobody has to teach us how to cry. 
Nobody teaches a baby how to smile or laugh. Uh, nobody even teaches you how to recognize that a smile is, is comforting and a frown is frightening. Uh, nobody teaches babies to be afraid of falling or to be afraid of the dark. Uh, nobody teaches a baby to find comfort in a hug. There are things that we are born with, all of us. Uh, no matter where you come from, no matter what language you speak, no matter what country you travel to, if somebody smiles at you, you would immediately recognize joy, you would recognize anger, you would recognize pain, even if you don't understand the language. That emotional uh, profile is common to our humanity. The desire to live, the desire to protect the things that we love, the desire for a better life, uh, the desire to reproduce ourselves, to be remembered when we're gone. Joy, happiness, fear, hope. These are things that we come with. But to be Igbo, to be Yoruba, to be Alsa, somebody has to teach you this thing. Somebody has to teach you your culture. So if I take a baby born to Yoruba parents, uh, as soon as the baby comes out of the mother's womb, I take that baby and give that baby to an Alsa family, that baby will become an Alsa person because Yoruba is not in that baby's DNA or in that baby's blood. Somebody has to teach culture to the baby. So your culture will always be the culture of whoever raised you. Same with religion, you know, somebody has to teach you your religion. So that's what I mean that there is a humanity we share that is intrinsic to us, you know, but that, and, and that it comes first, you know. So if you see a boy or a young man in, in the streets cornered by a crowd, maybe a crowd of Muslims and the young boy is a Christian and the, the crowd wants to kill the boy because of his religion. You will see that the boy will be begging for his life. You will see in his eyes that he doesn't want to die. Now, if you flip it, if you flip it and the crowd is Christians and the, and the one begging is a Muslim, you will still see the same hunger and desire, and I don't want to die, please. So if you are the aggressor and you are looking at this person on the floor and you look past the fact that he is a Christian or a Muslim and you look deep in his eyes, you will see yourself, you will see your brother, you will see that the same way I don't want to die like this, that is how he too, he doesn't want to die like this. This is what I mean by shared humanity. You know, moreover, science and many religions are beginning to agree on one thing. That all men, and by all men, I mean all men and women. I was using the generic man, you know, all men and women have a common ancestor. It's something that has been scientifically proven now. You know, and there's also something that many of the great religions also teach us that we all descended from a common ancestor. We all have a common father and mother, ultimately. So that is what I mean by that. It, it you know, if we can have conversations outside of this about about that, but I'm just saying that culture and religion have to be taught, you have to teach the person to be Igbo or Yoruba or Alsa, you know, but um, I haven't seen any baby that if you throw them up, <laughs> they won't 
you know, they do like that because they're just, they come with that fear of falling. It's just human. Yeah. So that's what I mean. But thank you for that question, Bob uh, Major. Thank you so much, sir, for your perspective. Thank you so much. I I would like for any other person that has a question to send it because we're about to close. We're really, really late on the time. I'm so sorry about that. So please, if you have questions, if you have inquiries, please send them as soon as possible so we can round up the program. Thank you so much, my panelists. I'm grateful for your time and for your perspective. That's fine. Okay, so if there are no questions for them, I'm just going to pass on the table or the mic or whatever to the moderator to run the program. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Appreciate it. And it's a pleasure meeting you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. And uh, it's great to hear you share this. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to say thank you to everybody for being a part of this. And uh, before we close this this uh, the summit, I would I would uh, equally want us to take a short interlude and show a, doc a short documentary teaser. All right, because of time, I would I'd actually drop the link to the trailer. All right, because of time, because of time, I would I'd actually drop the link to to the documentary in the chat box, the YouTube link, so we can. And um, on behalf of the entire team, I want to say thank you to everybody for being a part of this. The, the entire event continues tomorrow by 11 a.m. West African time. So once again, I'd like to say thank you on behalf of the entire tribe. Thank you for being a part of this. Have a wonderful and lovely evening. Bye for now.